John Dami made the beat and I'm gon' kill it. I think there's definitely a child star curse. Uh, I don't think I avoided it. I think there are many type of curses that happens with a child star. The ones that the public sees are, you know, drug addiction, my life is crap, you know, my parents stole my money, that whole thing. Then there's another one that a small group of child stars who had parents that did not steal from them, that, you know, really have their head on straight, doesn't mean that we don't have issues. Depression, mental instability, disassociation disorder, a very skewed way of understanding that we are now, well, that I'm now an adult. I have a little bit of arrested development when it comes to that. At times I feel 70 years old, but then at times I feel four years old. I can be in a room full of adults, even though I'm an adult, I still call adults adults. Um, I can be in a room full of adults and be like, y'all have no idea what's going on. Because at a very young age, I was in a room full of adults and had to act that way. And then there's, it's, it's, it's deep, right? So there's, um, there's also that situation where you're super young, you are on a show, you know how much you're making, you know what it comes with, you know all the journeys, you, you follow rules better than any other child in your age bracket, whether in normal school or not, because it's a television show and this is a business. But at the same time, you have to go home, clean your room, get in trouble, make sure you get AIDS, and you're like, but hold up, I make the money, I'm confused. But then you still have to like go into childhood. So I think there is a different kind of curse, again, that that is not as overt, but it does have friction in life later. Take a pick while I can't. I got the Seuss mix, ting a ling a boom. I pop for your pick. She's a um, chick jam, the letter rap. Chick jam, chick choo, the letter rap flash. Gobble, zoom, gobble down my lyric. Every day of your life is a page in your book. The person I am, my book is available for all to read at all times. So if I don't want an embarrassing chapter, get your together and don't have an embarrassing chapter. So while that can lead to me not going out and having a full 21 year old blowout party or, you know, get caught in the streets with my skirt up and doing some crazy, I'm at home making sure my chapters are good and grinding. So there's a way out, don't get it twisted. I have my fun times. I just have them in my own house with an NDA before people come in. Cause honey, if you talk to a couple people in LA, they know about my house parties. So it's not a game. I know how to get through it, but I'm also not the one that searches out for the paparazzi. Cause I know what can happen and you see it every day. And I'll probably get my ass whooped by my mama if anything comes out like that. And I'm 35, so I don't really have time for that. I got to do. The story goes that when I was being pushed in a stroller, people used to think I was a doll. And so my parents got me into modeling. You know, my father really loved the Cosby show. My mother really loved the Cosby show, so they watched it a lot. And the story goes, I have no clue, I don't remember, but that I got up one day and I said, I can do what Rudy can do. And so they sold everything they had got in this car, which I kind of remember because I sat in the back seat and had these wings on the, on the uh, back window. Super 1980s car. I don't know what it was, but it was not my favorite to sit in the back because it wasn't a seat. Anyway, drove to New York, signed with Elite Modeling Agency, went on a lot of different auditions, lived in Queens, not very high end. We didn't have a lot of money. So Beanie Weenies was my favorite meal and that little, pot, hot dogs and baked beans and, um, you know, really pushed. My dad really wanted to make sure that the world knew my name, not just my character name. 
So every opportunity that came across our desk, as long as it really furthered the brand of Raven Simone he took. And I was right there learning my lines, making sure I performed. As my parents said, it's time to razzle dazzle. So that, if anybody says that to me, I go, hey, what's up, how are you, nice to see you. Like I turn it on in a weird way, which I'm learning how not to anymore, but yeah. My memory of childhood really starts with the blue flooring on the Cosby Show, walking into the studio, and the smell of the sawdust at, uh, at the studio itself. Minimal, minimal memories of school. A few memories of the place where I lived in New York but mostly just blacked out. I have to be honest, my memory of my childhood in the industry is very minimal. Uh, I have association disorder. <laughs> I tend to forget stuff quickly, except for scripts and how much that check is. I think I forget a lot of my childhood because it was intertwined with so many personal journeys and uh, things that I just kind of want to forget in general, plus jobs, being young on a set and having to learn upwards of 20 pages of script each week and then purging to learn another 20 pages each week kind of preps the brain for just keeping what it needs to. So it's not very pleasurable now because <laughs> I get asked, hey, do you remember me? I'm like, mm-hmm. So when I was younger on The Cosby Show, they would bring us a script on Monday. My parents would read me the script at night and my lines every night before I went to sleep. And my prayer was, uh, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mommy, God bless Demi. God bless grandmama, God bless grandma Lulu. Help me say my lines, help me concentrate on my lines, help me have a beautiful smile, good night. That would be the last thing I said to sleep. And then I'd wake up and I knew my lines and that's just how I did it. So prayer, <laughs> I guess. I think at a much younger age, it was just, this is what we do. This is who you're going to be. You follow it, you listen, you pay attention and you practice. And the world is really difficult and we wanna make sure that when you get older, you're taken care of and you have a career that's you know sustainable in a way. And so I went along for the ride. I was told how much I was making. I was told that I have taxes. I was told that this is the money you make, so you either stay in this industry or you make a 16th of this with a normal job. So what are you gonna do? So it's like, um, I'll do 20 minutes of work. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, do I have problems sometimes and I don't wanna do the job and I don't feel like this is who I'm supposed to be on an overall because this is all I've ever done for the past 35 years? Yeah, but I also know that's just where I'm stuck. If anybody wanted to get in the industry, I would say Hollywood can be thicker than blood sometimes. And so be careful. Everybody has great intentions when they come into the industry. Everybody is like, I'm gonna, you know, cater to my child, I'm gonna make sure they're good, I'm gonna do this and do that. But there's a lot of stuff involved. There's a lot of egos involved. There's a lot of greed involved that might not bubble to the surface in a way that we typically see, but it does change the dynamic of parent and child. No doubt about it. And I would never put my child in the industry until they were over the age of 15. I, um, I wouldn't do it. And even then I'd be like, I think you should wait till you're 18, have a life. Um, because since the age of three, I don't know what life is other than this. And you think things are always greener on the other side. So when I turned 24, 25, I was like, I'm retired. I'm getting out, I'm over it. And I left and I sat on the couch, did what I needed to do. And I was like, um, it's like I stopped walking because this is all I know. So I went back because it's just easier. So it's like, you know, I, I just wouldn't put my child in it as young as I was in it, that's all. My parents had to make 
overtly efforts to make sure that I understood that I was the child and that they were the parent because at any time, with the responsibilities that one gets when on a television show, you can get an ego. There is an understanding that it's not the same as just a normal kid that went to school and your parents did that. But there is a little bit of a dynamic and what that is, I haven't put my finger on yet, but it's, it's an underlining thing. I'm no doubt about it. I can only tell you how the journey to the Cosby Show happened through folklore that my parents told me how to answer that question when I was younger. Um, I do know that they grinded. My mom said she worked during the night and my dad took me to auditions during the day or vice versa. Every night, understanding that this is a job you can't mess up. This is not for fun, but it is fun. Make sure you respect people. Don't do this, don't do that. It was a lot of rules in place. You know, it's doing an album at five and staying in the studio until two, one o'clock in the morning and you're five years old knowing that this is the next step in your career, so suck it up and let's do it. Um, it's, you know, whoosh. <laughs> you just do what you gotta do. Honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember working with, I don't remember a scene. I don't remember anything while it's a rehearsal or a camera. I remember the smell of the soul food coming out of his dressing room. I remember this, okay, so when we opened the show uh, in front of a live studio audience, you had to walk up these stairs and we came down that classic staircase. I remember standing up there and playing with the wood before I went down. I do not remember as soon as the camera starts. Something clicks off and I do what I'm trained to do. Yeah, when I turned 18, I knew something was going on, so I started going to therapy and it's dissociation. I just black out. I turn into who I'm supposed to be when the camera's on um, and then I come back to when normal life resumes. Again, it's, it's bottled up with just bottled, it's bottled up, that's all. <laughs> I will say this, that, you know, I don't necessarily remember what happened on The Cosby Show. However, every human, right, as you get older, you, you subconsciously remember what happened to you were a kid and you replay these things out. So working on Raven's Home, working with kids, I'm just doing this stuff and I'm just like, oh, I wonder if this is what happened to me. It's so important to have a cast that is gelled appropriately. And with that, they place you where you're supposed to be. They work with you, especially knowing that you're younger. I'm sure, I mean, I still have a great relationship with Malcolm Jamal Warner and I don't even know why. I just know that I adore him. I can't really tell you the genesis of it, but I'm sure he helped me when I needed it and everyone vice versa. So it's the camaraderie on set that happens when you have a family like that. It's the understanding that my dad would not have it any other way and like uh, get in your spot. And it's the discipline of it all. I without a doubt believe that everyone was there for the betterment of the show and the betterment of the show is to make sure your youngest castmate knows what's going on. But there was also the understanding that Bill Cosby doesn't always stick to scripts. So you have to listen in the scene and pay attention. And you know, you just gotta, you gotta pay attention. Only thing I'm scared of in the industry is when I have to accept an award or actually be myself in front of something because it's not scripted and I can't fall on the sort of, well, they wrote it, it's not my fault. I think the stress happened for Hang On Mr. Cooper because I did Hang On Mr. Cooper when I was seven years old to 11 years old. At that time, the conversation of weight started to come up and don't eat this, don't eat that, and you know, you have to be on point, and it was a little bit more lackadaisical, and the stress of being around people that I'm more cognizant of because I'm not three years old, 
and whatever stress seven-year-olds go through, like in trying to be in a new school and be liked and whatever, let's magnify that by probably 30 on the fact of you can't mess up in front of a live studio audience because your each show costs about a million dollars to make, so you just wanna make sure that you don't mess up. I'm sure those thought processes started to permeate within my body, making my stress level go up a lot more. Yeah, at a younger age, when my weight started to, when, when the conversation of weight started to come into my head, I heard it, didn't understand it, did what I was told, but then behind the scenes ate because looking back, that was the only thing that I could really control. That was the only thing that uh, I had for myself. My clothes were picked. The words I was saying out of my mouth were someone else's or practiced multiple times. Interviews plus in front of the camera. Uh, things were just really controlled because here in Hollywood, that's what happened. So food was pretty much the only thing that I could. So my favorite was like two bagels with cream cheese and tomato in the microwave. And I just remember like, she can't eat that anymore. I'm like, this is like the only thing. I get A's, like, let me have something. So it kind of got out of control because as I got older, I could hide it and it just happened. But I look back and I'm like, I wasn't even fat. I'm confused, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, I lost 70 pounds. Um, I look like a bobblehead back then when I look back. I lost weight initially because my stress level went down, the show ended, and I didn't have to worry about anything and, and things of that nature, and it just kept going and going, and then I actively did you know, things to make it go away. But every single picture on the carpet, every single moment, I was literally cussing everybody out because I remember that a lot more people wanted to talk to me then. I got a lot more magazine offers. I got a lot more offers for And I just was like, that's so rude. That's so rude. And I would just like, my outfits were like $15 on the carpet. I wore like the messiest wig I could. And I'm like, y'all are still talking to me? This is ridiculous. Hollywood is a hot mess. Because I lost that weight and you can feel sexually attracted to me in a weird way you want to come talk to me now i turned down a lot of stuff i did a show when i was small er and i remember someone in the meeting when i first went in she was like oh my god i thought you were going to be fat and i said you you know how long it took me to do this thanks thank you so much but i got a show so here we go i wore a fat suit the first couple episodes because i was too skinny for the first time in my life so there's just like a lot of stuff surrounded by weight for me that's not very pleasurable and I probably even though I'm losing weight now it's for a different reason and I'm doing it on my own terms not because somebody wants to have a show with me or wants to add me to their magazine all of a sudden because they weren't doing that before yeah I do have a little bit slash huge chip on my shoulder because between the ages of 15 and 24 I was ridiculed and bullied for my weight and size. I find a way to feel comfortable in my skin and now everybody's okay with it, but nobody's coming back and looking back like, oh, she was there, you know, other people will get the recognition. And I'm egotistical, listen, I just want the recognition. I was big and thick before all these big and thick ones were out here on TV shows and I'm just saying I was there, but I'm not gonna get the credit for it. And that's okay. I'm working on it in therapy. Um, I feel like it's fantastic that the world is coming around realizing that you can be in the skin you're in as long as you're healthy. I think it's amazing, but it sucked being in the industry during the 2000s when you know you had all these skinny minis out here making journeys and you know, you don't get that and you're on blogs and people are calling you all kinds of things and you had your mama calling you up like, you need to lose weight because they're talking about you. I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna eat this in and out and I'm gonna sit here and be super happy. Y'all gonna have to figure it out for yourselves. I'm not gonna do it. Kiss my I am definitely a big auntie when it comes to the kids that I work with. I do worry about them. I do have my thoughts that they'll never know about what's happening in their lifestyle, you know what I mean? Because that's not my position to say anything. 
but I do, I, I look at the signs. There are some that listen and some that don't, and that's the way the world works. But ultimately I give everyone the same advice. I give everyone the same, you know, cards. And that is one thing they'll tell you as a kid is you're a kid, work as hard as you can now and then you can sleep later when you're old. It is misconception and it is not fair. Just because we're young doesn't mean you can work us to the bone. They say, oh, you're young, you have the energy. No, I don't, I'm a human, leave me be. They will work you because you're trying to build a brand, so you gotta go, 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 go. No, take a vacation. Stop and enjoy life, because when you're that young and you're good, they'll work you until you are absolutely crazy. And it's no one's fault, but the beautiful carrot that gets put in your face on an everyday basis. And then if you're not smart enough and you don't have the foundation, you continue to follow a carrot even when your time is done. When then you have that journey of people like, why are you still working? Go sit down. You know what I mean? Like you have to be okay with disappearing for a while because this hopefully you'll have a very long life. So sit down, go get married, enjoy your life, and then come back. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of the times, the rat race, especially now with the social, I gotta be on it, I gotta be on it, I gotta be on it, you're gonna burn yourself out. I tell them this, I let them know. I'm like, you need to make sure you know what's going on with your money. You need to make sure that you know what's going on with your paperwork. You need to make sure you understand that at a certain age, there's gonna be that weird parent-child dynamic situation where you gotta like, hmm, you have to, you have to take control of your life. And when you have family and work together, you gotta figure that out. And sometimes it can be difficult and sometimes it's easy. There's a couple of stages. I made sure that my progression into adulthood is a slow progression so everyone's comfortable. Uh, I'm very meticulous in that sense. I'll be with people like, you need to hurry up. I'm like, no, 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 no. So it started at age 15, the next one was at 18, the next one was at 25. I'm actually in the middle of one right now. And it's just a slow progression of becoming an adult after 18 to 20 something years of being a kid. And you know, normal kids do that by going to college and having their first year in college and then you're adult, like this is different. This is a different world. You can't do that here. You gotta like teach people how to treat you because they've been used, and that's not family, that's everybody around you. You gotta teach people how to treat you because they've been treating you as a child and property for so long. So it's like this weird, it's a weird journey, but you do it slow. You don't do it fast. You don't try to take it because at the same time, the person has to learn. Like I have to learn what taxes are. I have to learn how to deal with my money because I've been giving it to my business manager taking care of it. And I'm like, oh, how do you do taxes? Okay, teach me. Oh, I understand now, let me do it. That's the conversation I had at 29. I should have been known how to do that, but I'm over here making the money, so it's like a trade-off. My mom, she taught me how to save money. Um, I get a check, half of it goes away, I never see it again because it's invested and half of it comes to me, I can buy whatever I want but you always have to save your money because you might not get a job and you gotta sustain yourself. I also like money. I like making it. So real estate, um, investments, I'm always there. I am the first person to be like, hmm, what company's about to happen? Let me buy some of that. Because my ultimate goal is to never work again. So bye, I need to make sure I got money working for me and things happening. Since I started in the industry, there was pressure about having a reputation. So when I started working for Disney, I think they loved me because they didn't have to worry about me. I already knew what the deal was. I knew their demographic and I knew what you couldn't sell and what you could sell. So, you know, we're kind of simpatico in that way. I'm not gonna ruin my brand and that means you're not gonna get your brand ruined. Yeah, there is a stigma. You're a kid forever, that's how it is. I have no regrets about it. I do what I need to as an adult. And there are some adults who wanna act a certain way and there are some adults that don't, you know? And I'm just one of those ones where outwardly to the public that I know thousands and millions of people are gonna be watching, you know, I wanna make sure that when I try to teach my kids later how to be respectful, 
They're not like, well, mom, you did this. No, I didn't. You can't find it. You can't prove it. There's not one picture. Prove it. You can't do it. So it's kind of in that world, <laughs> you know. There was a pilot called Absolutely Psychic. It was about a psychic girl and her best friends. And <laughs> at the time, there was also some controversy during my wife and kids because the daughter was about to be let go. And so I auditioned for both roles. I auditioned for my wife and kids, and I also auditioned for the best friend of a pilot called Absolutely Psychic. And for one of the first times in my life, I got to choose uh, behind the scenes which one I wanted to go for. I did one episode of My Wife and Kids, and while I was on that set, I got the call. They were like, well, this pilot's getting picked up with you. I was like, well, what do you mean with me? They were like, we want to change it over to that, to Raven being psychic and you having friends. And I go, am I on My Wife and Kids? or am I gonna have my own show on Disney Channel? And at the time it wasn't, I forgot what my wife and kids was on, but it wasn't a network show. So I was like, mm, I'll have my own show, that's kinda cool. And that's what happened. I think why I went back to playing Raven Baxter, because I like her. I like just not caring in front of the screen. It's not a rigid situation, you know? It's not trying to be someone's daughter in this scene. I am free to act crazy as I want to. And my mom was like, what's wrong with you? I said, I used to watch Mad TV Stuart, that character modeled Raven after him. Um, you know, Ace Ventura loved it, did stuff from Ace Ventura. Like I was able to put all of these amazing comedic moments that I watched and loved Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, and just go for it. And that's Raven Baxter. So I'll go back to her until I'm tired. Didn't realize the legs or potential that that's what Raven could have, but I did understand what it takes to have your own show and for it to be successful. So if you look at the most successful shows with comedians at the front of it, you know, you have The Cosby Show, you have Martin, you have Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you have Everybody Loves Raymond. You have these characters that are surrounded by a cast so that they can thrive, but ultimately they're being themselves. They're let free, they're able to work, they're able to move, they're able to, you know, grow and Disney Channel, Michael Poya, Susan Sherman, and all of the writers at the time, including the ones that happened in the future, really surrounded myself with amazing people, Rondell Sheridan, Takiya Crystal Kamar, Orlando Brown, Annalisa Vanderpool, Kyle Massey, with really amazing talent and let us go ape crazy. And we did. You can see the authenticity of the joy we had on that set permeate the screen. You know, you can watch other shows that don't last that long and you're like, something's going on there. It might not gel as well, you know? So those hit shows have that formula that is called lightning in a bottle and you try to recreate it and it's difficult, but I think that's why it gained so much happiness. We encapsulated a time period when, you know, you had people in our age bracket that just wanted to have fun didn't care, wasn't trying to be uptight or super sexy. And the writers enjoyed writing for us because I was never that type of actress that um, cared if a hair was out of place or cared about my image outside of the show. I was like, what do you need me to do? Pie in the face while doing a split? Let's go. You know, and some actresses you would meet in my age bracket, they're like, but my boyfriend's watching. And I'm like, I don't have a boyfriend, let's go. You don't even know what I like, so let's have it. You know what I mean? So I think it was just the freedom that we had that really propelled it to where it was and where it went. There were a couple of reasons why I did The View. Um, one, everybody that I grew up with in the industry around my age bracket, Lindsay and all these people, made their transition to adulthood by over-sexualizing themselves. 
I decided to go into The View to show my adulthood by my brain. One, two, whoopee ass me. Okay. <laughs> You don't say no to an EGOT, and I just love her so much. I just wanted to be up underneath her. And um, very difficult decision. One of the hardest jobs I've ever had. The second hardest was Broadway. And would I do it again? Perhaps not. But it was a learning experience beyond. I learned a lot about myself. Very confident in who I am. Showed me even more about free speech for myself and for other people to talk about me. And uh, I met my wife then, so that was great. There's some good and bad, you know what it is. That show was one of the most stressful shows I have ever been a part of. The fact that I wasn't really a big political person to begin with, and they sold me on this idea as this is gonna be the new pop culture show and you're gonna talk about this and that. Yeah, we'll put some politics here and there, but nothing you can't learn. Okay, cool, I get there and it's like, I'm sorry, trust me, y'all don't wanna hear what I have to say because I'm a millennial, I don't believe in any of this old school stuff that's actually running the country, I'm gonna get in trouble. And you know, ultimately, we see where I am now <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Right before I left LA to move to New York, I had a big old house party. Ask about it. <laughs> it was bomb. And uh, we met at an event a couple days before. No, one day before. We met at an event one day before. I was like, come over to the house. Come say goodbye to me, right? And she came, she chilled, it was fantastic. And then I went to New York and I invited her there. Like literally super lesbian, just met and kept, just kept going, just kept going. And that happens because there's a connection. We talked a little bit about some of the weird little things that happens when you're a child star. And one of those things is really being able to read people uh, because in my opinion, we not only have to meet someone that we've never met before and have a full relationship with them and pretend that they're your mother or your great grandfather in a heartbeat, but you also have to interact with that person outside as if you've met forever. So reading people and understanding who they are, I can do in a glance or a heartbeat. I'm very, very particular. And with her, I could look at her, she looked at me and we both saw the the happiness, the pain, the world, the whole thing. And so we just didn't want to separate from each other. And she moved to New York, then I broke up with her, but I love her still, and then we're back. <laughs> Let me tell you why Miranda got a ring. Miranda knows how to make me speak truth even when I don't want to. She's like my therapist, my lover, my bestie. She doesn't let me get away with stuff, but at the same time, she's super sweet. I mean, listen, you know, when I was growing up and you fall and you start crying, girl, suck it up, we gotta go. You know what I mean? I mean, everybody has some family like that. Miranda's like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, thanks, babe. Like, it's like that kind of love. So when we were dating, She just would ask me questions. I'm like, what are you, why are you asking these questions? I, I'm confused. No one's ever asked me these questions before, which also like made stuff bubble up in me that I wasn't able to deal with. And no one's ever done that before. Most people like to tiptoe around me because of my quick nature with my tongue. And so she's different. It was very uncomfortable and I didn't like it. I did not like it at all. And so I left and I went through a couple other relationships and I remember calling her and being like, you were right. This is who I am. I have to figure it out. I can't stand you and I love you so much. So help me figure it out for the rest of my life so I can be a better person. Um, the moment that came when I was like, you know what? I'm this way, I'm not as girly girl as people see me in these shows and this brand that was created for Raven Simone. I'm super in my skin, this is who I am, came and I you not during lockdown in a public way. So for instance, the way you see me now is how I normally am at home. 
But before lockdown, when I went out to be Raven Simone, I put on the bells and whistles to match that brand. You know, in the industry, when you're always trying to make sure that the brand is forefront and that you're projecting the right image, I tended to put my sexuality and growth in my gender and sexuality on the back burner because that's not what I was taught should be in the forefront. So what I did, I just did on a whim. It's not like I thought about it, I had to mull over it, I just did what I needed to do in my time off and then was Raven Simone necessary. So during lockdown, all of it came flooding in, honey, all of it came flooding in. I was like, oh, I don't wanna deal with this. You have people out here body conscious in a beautiful way. I'm like, I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to be that same person that they told me to be back in the day, which is very hard to break that programming since you were three years old. So it's even confusing to me sometimes, but I have someone that's like, no, you should wear your hair. No, 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 go ahead and wear a t-shirt. You're fine, go ahead and put your, your stilo on. You got it, and I'm like, oh, thank you, babes. I won't put that weave in and extra makeup on to make sure somebody was attracted to me in whatever way Hollywood wanted a female to look. Like, okay, I'm good with that. And yeah, it's coming out at a time when it could be looked at as, well, you're just following this and following that. But the difference is, is that y'all never saw me when I went home. So y'all don't know what I look like when I went home. Yes, we will have children. Yes, we will. We're figuring out how we're gonna do that. The best part of being a lesbian is you can plan it. <laughs> Cause you have to. So we're just gonna plan it to the T. My wife is a doula, so she's all about life. And that's exciting to know. So we're gonna make sure that we do it the right way. It's difficult to differentiate who yourself is in your brain and who someone else wants you to be in your brain. And I think that's another reason why we have a hard time listening because we're combating, well, I could be that, I could be that, I could be that, and I want that, but what is your body doing? Like, I know for a fact when I do television shows, I stress out, so I gain weight. Something's to that. I don't know if that's PTSD, I don't know if it's like I'm taking on too many things, but I just tend to burp, 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 cause I'm eating and I need, I need to self-soothe in some way. When I started directing, I felt confident and stronger and not self-soothing as much. And so, yeah, I know when I start to get teary-eyed and verklempt, I say, oh, no, something's wrong. The ideal is to be one of the most in-demand sitcom directors. There's probably this many black female sitcom directors with the track record that I'm intending to have. But ultimately, I wanna be able to take what I've learned for the past 35 years and rework how it's done in a way. When I was on the Cosby Show and hanging with Mr. Cooper, there was a respect, understanding, protocol, and time management that has gotten away from sitcoms in general, and I don't like it. And I wanna bring it back to the old school while putting a spin on it. And I think that coming from someone who has been a child star, so I know times and I know this, but also someone that's now been behind the scenes and working with the company, I think I have a very interesting way of looking at stuff. Um, Ron Howard, Jodie Foster, world. I'm trying to get there. And then I have that thing where I can't fully not be in front of the camera because that's all I know. So YouTube, but it's on my own terms. It's just stuff that's coming out of my own mouth. It's not shined up and spit and edited 17 million times and a week's worth of rehearsal. It feels better to me. It feels real. It feels like the next step in who Raven Simone is as the person you enjoy watching because I'm tired of playing somebody else. So that's why that's happening. There's more to life than Hollywood, yo. There's more to life than Hollywood and we get caught up and we continue to try to follow the carrot. And sometimes that carrot is just a very, very, very shiny hologram. It's not even real. 
It's changing though. Hollywood is changing. Some stuff that's a wild, wild west out there. You know what I mean? Like there's so many other ways to become famous. So the journey has changed, but ultimately it's still a manufactured piece of work for entertainment. What you see on television is not real. Sorry. Ain't the beat and I'm gonna kill it.